Our last item of business is to just dip our toes a little bit into the water of nonlinear systems of ODEs. These are the bread and butter of the subject. For example, we have the Fitzhugh Nagumo equation. These are used to model the behavior of a neuron in a very simplistic way. It's a system of two ODEs for V and W. It's the case of uh, an activator inhibitor system is what it's known as. V is the membrane potential and W is an inhibitor. The nonlinearity comes through this function F of V. It's just a cubic function of V in this case. Another famous example are the Locke of Volterra equations. These are also called the predator prey equations. Again, this is a simple system of two equations and two variables. U represents a prey species that tends to grow when it's on its own, but it's predated on, on by the species V. V gains from interactions with U, but dies out on its own. These equations have the general form x1 prime is a function of t, x1, and x2 and x2 prime is another function of t, x1, and x2. If we use a vector notation, we can summarize that as x prime is f of t and x, where x and f are vector variables. If this function of t and x doesn't actually depend on t, we call the system autonomous, just like we did in the scalar case. There is one interesting special case. Back when we were looking at scalar problems, if we have a non-autonomous scalar problem, then we can define new variables. And then this is an autonomous system in two variables. So just like we saw for order of the equation, non-autonomy can also be traded in for an increased dimension. In two-dimensional problems, we can look at a variation on the direction field If we make a plot in the phase plane with x1 and x2 as the axes, the solution curves are parameterized by t, and at any point on one of these curves, the vector dx1 dt dx2 dt is the tangent vector. So that means that f1 and f2 which can be computed at any point, provides the tangent to the solution curve. As usual, we're interested in equilibrium solutions of the equations. So that occurs when f1 and f2 are both equal to zero. At such a point, x1 and x2 equal to constants is a constant solution of the equations. So what do we know about the stability of these equilibrium points? How do we determine it? But we're going to use a technique from vector calculus of linearization of a function of two variables. So we can take the value at the equilibrium point plus the partial derivative of f1 with respect to x1 times the difference x1 minus the point and then the partial derivative of f1 with respect to x2 times the difference in x2 from the point. 
these partial derivatives are understood to be evaluated themselves at x1 star, x2 star. We have a similar approximation for the function f2 near the equilibrium point. These approximations should be valid if these differences xi minus xi star remain small. Of course, since the point is in equilibrium, these constant terms are both zero. So this leads us to define u1 as the difference between x1 and x1 star, and similarly for u2. u1 and u2 are the departures from equilibrium. It's just a more natural set of coordinates for the problem. And of course, u1 prime is the same as x1 prime and the same for u2. So here are our linear approximations. Because of the ODE, we can put in x1 prime and x2 prime. With our change of variables, we can put in u1 prime and u2 prime. And then on the other side, we can put in u1 and u2. All together in vector form, the derivative of the vector u is approximately a matrix of the four different partial derivatives. times the vector u. This matrix here is a very important one. It's known as the Jacobian matrix. It is essentially the first derivative of a multidimensional function. In general, the Jacobian matrix would be the matrix of all values, partial derivative of fi with respect to xj. i is the row index, j is the column index, and they run over all the dimensions of the system. Of course, for us, n equals 2. In general, this would be an n by n matrix. And because it is essentially a derivative, it depends on the variable. It itself is a function. To summarize, near an equilibrium point, the deviation from equilibrium nearly satisfies a linear system of equations with a constant matrix A. We know all about finding the stability of that kind of system. For example, we look at the nonlinear pendulum. Using the usual change of variables, we can rewrite this as a first order system. So that defines our F1 and F2. At an equilibrium point, both of these functions have to be zero simultaneously. The first one tells us then that x2 must be zero, and then the second one tells us that sine of x1 is zero, which means that x1 is an integer multiple of pi. So it looks like we have infinitely many 
equilibrium points, but physically speaking, theta is an angle measured from the straight down position. So theta equals zero is straight down. Theta equals pi is straight up. Theta equals two pi is straight down again, three pi is straight up, and so on, and also for the negative values. So there are only two physically distinct equilibrium points. You can calculate the Jacobian matrix. DF1 dx1 is 0, and DF1 dx2 is 1. DF2 dx1 is minus g over L times the cosine, and DF2 dx2 is just negative b. At our first equilibrium point, x1 star and x2 star are both 0. So we plug those values into the Jacobian. And now we get a matrix of just constants. You can work out the eigenvalues of this matrix. Behavior could be different depending on the sign of this discriminant under the radical. If that's negative, then the eigenvalues are complex, but the real part of both of them is negative b over 2. b is assumed to be a positive parameter, so that's negative. If the discriminant is positive, then both eigenvalues are real, but the square root of that discriminant is a little smaller than b. So when we add that to negative b, we get something which is still negative. A negative minus a positive number is also negative. In either case, this is a stable equilibrium point, either a spiral or a node. At the other equilibrium point, x1 is equal to pi. When we put that into the Jacobian matrix, it just flips the sign of one of the entries. The eigenvalues look very similar, but they behave very differently. Now the discriminant is always positive. So the eigenvalues are always real. And the square root of the discriminant is always bigger than b. So when I add that to negative b, I get something which is real and positive. So this point is always an unstable saddle point. The other eigenvalue will be negative. Another example is the predator-prey system. At equilibrium, both x1 prime and x2 prime must be zero. So in the first equation, I can factor out x1. From the second function, I can set, factor out x2. One possibility in the first equation is that x1 is zero. And then, from the second equation, we find that x2 has to be 0 as well. Or, in the first equation, we could take the other option, set x2 equal to 6, and then the second equation tells us x1 has to be equal to 4. So we have two equilibrium points. We can compute the Jacobian, derivative of f1 with respect to x1, has two entries. Derivative of f1 with respect to x2. df2 dx1 
and df2 dx2. So at the first equilibrium point, the origin, the Jacobian is actually diagonal. So immediately we know that the eigenvalues are 3 and negative 1. So the origin is an unstable saddle point. At the other equilibrium point, we can find the Jacobian. Its eigenvalues are purely imaginary. So this is a stable point in the linearization, but it's the weakest kind, it's a center point, and the nonlinearity could tip the balance one way or the other. It could be stable or unstable nonlinearly. Here's a look at the predator-prey equations and the linearizations around their equilibrium points. So here I'm defining the two functions that define the equations for predator-prey particular numerical values. Here's how we can define the Jacobian matrix. So D is an operator in Mathematica that takes partial derivatives. There's the Jacobian matrix for any value of x1 and x2. So if I start with the equilibrium point at the origin here, and delta is a parameter that's going to control how closely I look at the, or how closely I zoom in around the equilibrium point. So there's the solution to predator-prey near the equilibrium at zero. Now we can compare that to the linearization. So here I'm going to just use the linearization as the product of the Jacobian matrix with u1 and u2. Remember, that's our notation for the differences from the equilibrium point. And if I plot those side by side, nonlinear on the left, linear on the right, you can hardly see any difference at all between those. So near the equilibrium point, the linearization is a, is, is a good approximation. As I zoom out away from that point and compare the two plots, I'm still not seeing too many differences at this level. And if I go out even further, so now there's no sense in which I'm really keeping a small distance away from the equilibrium point. But even so, the linearization is not too far off, but you can definitely see some differences over here in the first quadrant. That's the unstable fixed point. It's clearly a saddle. If we look at the other equilibrium point, that is a center, and again, we'll zoom in close, then you can see this is the behavior near a center, right? The orbits are periodic and uh, very nearly circular or elliptical. So if I compare that to the linear case, again, we, we don't see much difference. There's some difference in how Mathematica chooses the points to plot, but the overall sense of the, the shapes of these orbits is not that different. But as I zoom out, we'll see more and more differences. So here's an intermediate value. But again, the nonlinear problem still looks like pretty much like ellipses over here. But finally, if I go out far enough, then the nonlinear character completely takes over, right? This doesn't look like any sort of linear phase portrait. So the linearization keeps on doing what it does everywhere, but the original nonlinear problem eventually deviates as you get farther away. Just to take a look at the behavior that includes both of the equilibrium points, the unstable one here at the origin and the stable one here, you can actually show that all the solutions are periodic orbits around this one equilibrium solution. Here's a look at the predator-prey equations and the linearizations around their equilibrium points. 
So here I'm defining the two functions that define the equations for predator prey, the particular numerical values. Here's how we can define the Jacobian matrix. So D is an operator in Mathematica that takes partial derivatives. There's the Jacobian matrix for any value of x1 and x2. So if I start with the equilibrium point at the origin here, and delta is a parameter that's going to control how closely I look at the, or how closely I zoom in around the equilibrium point. So there's the solution to predator prey near the equilibrium at zero. Now we can compare that to the linearization. So here I'm going to just use the linearization as the product of the Jacobian matrix with u1 and u2. Remember, that's our notation for the differences from the equilibrium point. And if I plot those side by side, nonlinear on the left, linear on the right, you can hardly see any difference at all between those. So near the equilibrium point, the linearization is a, is, is a good approximation. As I zoom out away from that point and compare the two plots, I'm still not seeing too many differences at this level. And if I go out even further, so now there's no sense in which I'm really keeping a small distance away from the equilibrium point. But even so, the linearization is not too far off, but you can definitely see some differences over here in the first quadrant. That's the unstable fixed point. It's clearly its saddle. If we look at the other equilibrium point, that is a center, and again, we'll zoom in close, then you can see this is the behavior near a center, right? The orbits are periodic and uh, very nearly circular or elliptical. So if I compare that to the linear case, again, we, we don't see much difference. There's some difference in how Mathematica chooses the points to plot, but the overall sense of the, the shapes of these orbits is not that different. But as I zoom out, we'll see more and more differences. So here's an intermediate value. But again, the nonlinear problem still looks like pretty much like ellipses over here. But finally, if I go out far enough, then the nonlinear character completely takes over, right? This doesn't look like any sort of linear phase portrait. So the linearization keeps on doing what it does everywhere, but the original nonlinear problem eventually deviates as you get farther away. Just to take a look at the behavior that includes both of the equilibrium points, the unstable one here at the origin and the stable one here, you can actually show that all the solutions are periodic orbits around this one equilibrium solution.